Hello and welcome to the final summer season Moneybox special on coping with the recession. Of course, we may be too late. Some reports this week suggest the recession is over. Share prices around the world have had their best six months for 50 years. But in our final programme, we're looking not at shares but at housing. And here the picture's mixed. Average UK house prices are 20% below their peak, but estate agents are reporting activities picking up. Mortgage approvals are at a 17-month high, and some monthly house price indexes are showing the first hints of price rise after nearly two years of falls. We'll be visiting Northern Ireland, where the biggest house price boom was followed by the biggest bust, and some bought at precisely the wrong time. We bought our house in June 2007, and I offered 157. It's currently valued at 99,000, so we've lost the equivalent of 50 grand on the house. And I'll be reporting from Sheffield, where a successful buy-to-let landlady reveals her secret of making money from property, even now. But first, do the latest figures show that house prices have stabilised? Could they even be rising? Or is it just a pause in the roller coaster before that second death defying plunge? With me are three people to answer that and other questions on housing. Jonathan Davis is a chartered financial planner at Armstrong Davis. Jonathan, when you were last on Moneybox in December 2007, you predicted house prices would fall by up to 40% over between four and six years. The latest figures, though, show we've had the crash. They're going up. We've had the first leg of the crash. I believe that the trend is still very much down. No trend goes in a straight line. Otherwise, it be, wouldn't be called a trend. It'd be called a straight line. So what's causing this sort of 1% up in July, according to the Halifax? A number of reasons. I think the main reason is the government stimulus. And uh, there's no doubt, when you have that level of stimulus, it's going to have a short-term positive effect. But short-term being the key from your point of view. Also with us is Peter Bolton-King. He's chief executive of the National Association of Estate Agents. Peter, what are your members telling you is happening to house prices? Paul, you summed it up a moment ago. They certainly are finding that around the country, and bearing in mind there is not one, no such thing as one particular market, there's a lot of micro-markets, but around the country they're a lot more cheerful than they were, I think, when we spoke this time last year. Prices appear to have stabilised. There is some realism as far as asking prices are concerned, and I would say this is being generally fuelled by a distinct shortage of property at the moment. And, well, we've had a shortage of property, but there's also a shortage of mortgages. Paula John's here from Your Mortgage magazine. She's the editor-in-chief... Uh, Paula, are mortgages still holding back this demand for houses? Unfortunately, yes. There's a mortgage drought on. It's been on for quite a while now because lenders simply don't have the appetite to lend, certainly at higher loans to value. They haven't got the appetite to lend to first-time buyers and we don't see that changing any time soon. So that's really holding demand back. And what about the market? There isn't one market. We talk about the UK. We'll be looking at Northern Ireland in a moment. But what are the differences, Peter Bolton King, around the UK? Which markets are doing well or rising? Which markets are not? You know, it's very difficult to actually say a particular place is better than another one because what we're finding is, and there's no one UK market, there's not even a market within a town. It can be down to streets or areas. Just at the moment, for instance, there are many parts of London where things are flying again. And Paula, you mentioned the, the problem with mortgages. That's having a depressing effect. Jonathan said earlier he thought there was a long way to go in house price falls. What's your sense of it from, from the mortgage end? Well, um, we are hearing an awful lot about green shoots of recovery and average house prices picking up and so forth. My worry really is, though, that with a mortgage drought continuing to keep people out of the market, coupled with unemployment rising, it's set to go up another half a million before the end of the year. That's got to have a very real effect on the economy. And so I'm afraid I do agree with Jonathan that we could see a W-shaped recession here and a W shape when it comes to house prices, they could go down again. Yes, though W always goes up at the end. Uh, Jonathan, you're pessimistic in the sense if you think falling house prices are a bad thing, which of course not everyone does. You're pessimistic. Do you think having fallen again, as you think it will, the housing market will eventually come back? So safe as houses, meaning safe investments will be true again? Our long-term view is split into two periods. Um, prices are going to fall dramatically again until 2011-2012. Then they'll be broadly flat for another few years, as they were in the 90s. And then they will start rising from about 2015, as inflation generally is rising. But we do not believe that house prices will rise faster than inflation for the next 10 or 15 years, as they did in the last 10 or 15 years. Peter Bolton King, you're the most positive here about house prices going up in different rates in different parts of the country, but all, overall going up. What about unemployment? We are, we've seen rising unemployment. That's bound to have an effect on house prices, isn't it? 
absolutely right. It is bound to have an effect. But at the end of the day, we've got some fundamental underlying things that we must not forget about. We have, everybody agrees, a shortage of property. We're a small island at the end of the day, and we've got a growing population. Those people have got to live somewhere. Therefore, whilst I agree that things are probably going to, I don't think, drop, but are going to go along at a general level for the moment, I think, uh, obviously, clearly those things will have an effect. Jonathan Davis. You know, it's an, isn't it amazing? Estate agents, year in, year out, say the same things. There's a shortage of property, we're a small island, so on. We heard that in 2005 and 2006 and 2007. We've heard it every single year for the last 50 years. And in fact, it's never been economically the case. The, the reason why we had a house price bubble was because of credit, easy lending. We're not going to have easy lending for the next 10 years because of massive bank bad debts. So you don't think supply and demand is going to work its normal effect and push prices up? We do not have an over supply of demand, as it were. If that were the case, why have rents not risen in the last five years, in fact fallen in the last two? OK, well, uncertainty about the future. In the past, though, house prices have been up and down nowhere more than Northern Ireland. In 2006 and 2007, house prices were growing by around 50% a year. Since their peak in the spring of 2007, prices have plunged by more than a third, back to where they were in the first half of 2006. Whether that's good news or bad depends where you started, as Bob Howard found out. This is the tale of two men in their mid-twenties and how the result of Northern Ireland's unsustainable property boom has affected their lives. Just over two years ago, people here were gripped by a sort of house-buying fever, but now the mood is very different. I'm on the way to meet one first-time buyer who bought a property a few miles west of Belfast, just as the market peaked. My name's Kieran McElwain and I'm a van driver. I live in a wee village called Canal just outside Dromara in County Down. We sat and waited for months and months and months. We just kept saving the deposit, thinking, right, when should we go, when should we go? And it didn't slow down. The houses just kept getting more and more expensive. So we just sort of had to take the plunge. We bought our house in June 2007, and within a month, the bottom started slowly but surely falling out of it, and our house started losing value. And before we knew What it, did you pay for it? It was a two-bedroom townhouse, and I offered 157 And it's currently valued at, I think it's 99000 So we've lost the equivalent of 50 grand on the house. If interest rates stay low, I mean, you're on a fix at the moment, aren't you? And you're coming off that. If you go on to a very low rate, are you hopeful you'll be able to pay off that negative equity in a few years as opposed to a lot of years? My only straw, if you like, that I'm clutching at is our three-year fixed term was a 6.45. Whenever it finishes in June next year, the bank were offering me base rate plus one. So if it stays like that, fingers crossed, my mortgage will be... 1.5%, which is going to be a hell of a drop. Now, my plan is to keep paying the £1,000 a month, even if my repayment drops down to five or £600 on this 1.5%, I'm going to keep it a paying a £1,000. It'll allow me to chip away that wee bit faster, and instead of five years waiting on things, hopefully my plan is between two and three years. Do you need to move? I got married eight weeks ago. I would love to, within the next six months to a year, start our own wee family. It's not a family house at all. It's holding our plans to start a family back. We have to wait. Hopefully, the house is starting to slowly, slowly build, you know, so we can think about selling. But even whenever we do sell, where are we going to get our 20% deposit for a new property? Where is the light at the end of my tunnel? The banks. They don't want to know. So where do we stand with that? I'm now on the other side of Belfast to find out from local estate agent Victoria Pinkerton more about what happened to buyers like Kieran and what people buying now can expect. She's showing me a site where 24 new properties are being built. We're at a new development on the Cotton Road in Donica Day called Avonmore Court. The houses start for a three-bedroom house at 172,000 and they go up to 227,500. If this development was released in the height, you could see anything up to £350,000 for a property that you're getting now for £225,000. I think there was just a panic with buyers that if they weren't on the property ladder, if they didn't get on then, they were going to miss the boat and never get on. Um, and I think a lot of investors fueled the price rise. And the fall has been up to about 40% from peak to where we are at the moment? Roughly between 30 and 40%, depending on the location and the type of property. Now, I saw a figure that only just over 900 properties have been sold in the last quarter in the whole of Northern Ireland. That doesn't sound very many. I mean, 
how many would have been sold in the peak? Goodness, on average estate agents were hitting probably the top estate agents up to 30 properties a month. Last year we were hitting on three to four a month and I were hitting on around 10 a month. Things are picking up, but yes, it, it's not as busy as we, we would like. Adam Murray, a 25-year-old primary school teacher looking to buy his first home, is one of Victoria's clients. In order to afford one of the bigger properties here, Adam's agreed to take a loan of 25% of the price of the house from the builder, which he must pay back within 10 years. It's interest-free for two years, but after that he pays interest at 4%. And of course he's got the mortgage to pay on top. But unlike Kieran, he's confident in a few years' time he won't be ruining his decision. This is the first time I've been down to see our auto plot. Yeah. And you've got a lovely view out the back window. Yeah, well, this is green belt land, so <laughs> hopefully not, nothing will ever be built yeah. there. And then we've got the garden centre over there, so yeah. it is quite nice. We're really pleased. Just can't wait for it to be ready. And how big is the house and how much is it costing you? It's four bedrooms. Two of the bedrooms are en suite. It's 190000 so it's a wee bit more than we'll obviously hope to spend. But if we can afford to go for a bigger house, we may as well, because it'll save us having to move. and three or four years we can actually stay in this house and start a family if we wanted to. Danny and I both know we would have never got a house that we're getting now for 190,000 two or three years ago so. I mean, some people might think you're overextending yourself. Yeah well some people in my family do think that we're <laughs> overextending ourselves and they're advising us to just get a house for 150,000 but realistically we could stay in this house for the rest of our days if we wanted to. The money you're looking at is that three times your salary or I mean how are you well, how have you worked it out? My salary would be because I've just started as a teacher would be just over 20 between 21 and 22,000 so obviously we're relying on Jenny's salary and my fiance as well. We only are taking a mortgage for 140 because the builder is putting up a 25% deposit and that goes through the Bank and Building Society systems as a 25% deposit. So when you add our 10% deposit to that, it's going through as a 35% deposit we have, so therefore we're benefiting from a much better rate. Do you see any downside? I mean, you have to pay back within 10 years, don't yeah. you? If you don't, then they've got a charge on this property and well, they could sell it. Yeah, that's the downside. You've always got that £47,500 hanging over your head that you know you're going to have to pay back. but. Say your mortgage is £600 a month, if you put £800 a month away, within the 10 years you're going to have a certain amount saved up anyway. You just had the rest of your mortgage. First time buyer Adam Murray, ending Bob Power's report from, from the UK's biggest housing roller coaster. Paula John, of your mortgage magazine, that deal that Adam Murray had there, is that sort of deal widely available? Well, developers are certainly coming up with lots of weird and wonderful ways of getting people to, sit to actually buy their properties because they're desperate for cash. Obviously, property development is a, an industry that needs a lot of money and they're not seeing much of it at the moment. So we're seeing all sorts of different things. This sounds like a type of shared equity arrangement to me because developers aren't allowed to actually gift a deposit of more than 5% to a no, buyer. Because he's got to pay his mortgage and then within 10 years he's got to pay back a quarter of the value of the property as well. Without seeing all of the sort of fine print it's quite difficult to say as long as he's done his sums properly he's not going to have to move again as he said so at least that puts him in the good position of not having to go through the cost and expense of moving again if he wants to start a family. Well he hopes not as long as he, he and his fiance stay in work and can pay the bill. Exactly but then everyone's in that boat at the moment aren't they with the public sector cuts yeah. that we're talking about. Um, so things could turn out all right in this instance it sounds that the developer is well being, being imaginative and creative the whole thing goes through Halifax they're obviously happy with it which surprises me slightly because they're being very conservative. All the lenders are being conservative yeah, but lenders, what they'll do with developers Lenders the were happy with 100 and 125% mortgages. Mm, but that was a different world. John, Jonathan Davis. <laughs> My view on, on um, Mr Murray and his situation is that uh, it sounds a lovely home and, and good luck to him. He's a teacher, just qualified, so he probably has a fairly secure uh, career ahead of him. I can't help wondering, though, what the equivalent rent would be for a similar property and because our firm view is that house prices in Northern Ireland have still got a long way to go... Down. Yeah, absolutely. I don't see why he just doesn't rent for another couple of years and buy even cheaper by about probably about £50,000. Yeah, of course, he would be taking a gamble that you were right then, wouldn't he? Uh, Peter Bolton-King, are your members irresponsible in helping to sell these deals? Are they going to be the next great mis-selling scandal? 
No, I don't know why estate agents are accused of being irresponsible on these things. At the end of the day, the estate agent's job is to do the best for their client, whether that be the developer, whether it be a private individual, you, me, etc. Therefore, it's not the agent who is responsible for these things. If the person can get the uh, lender to agree, if it suits them on their on in their own situation, as we've heard, and if, fingers crossed, everything goes all right for Mr Murray, I think he'll actually be all right at the end of the day, but obviously there are a few ifs there. And Paula John, these are sold as a way to get that first home, as, as Adam Murray was doing. How hard is it now for first-time buyers? It's really not getting a great deal easier. I mean, there are some loans out there at 90% loan to value where you only need a 10% deposit, but the interest rates charged are punitive. To get a decent rate, really, you do still need a 25% deposit, and that, even though property prices have come down, 25% of the average property price is still an awful lot of money. So, ironically, of course, property prices come down, they're more affordable than they have been for years, first-time buyers can't actually get a look-in. Something like 40% of the first-time buyers who've bought this year have had some help, at least, from the bank of mum and dad. Now, you have to wonder when the bank of mum and dad's money is going to run dry, because mum and dad are suffering too in the current climate. Well, yes, pensions down and life longer, so they've got less money. Jonathan Davis... Presumably, if you are right and house prices do fall, will that be the moment of opportunity for first-time buyers? Will house prices fall enough to become affordable? I would say that, yes, house prices will become affordable after a 40 or 50% drop um, on average around the country. I might just say I don't believe that there are pockets, as was discussed earlier, because every single part of the country went up about 300%. So every single part of the country is going to go down 40 or 50%. But, as I say... People should not believe that when house prices eventually bottom, there's going to be any immediate V-shaped recovery. It's not like stocks and shares. It's a long-term game, and it will be years before they actually start rising properly. What about first-time buyers, Peter Bolton King? What are your members? Can your members help them find the right property and the right mortgage deal? They certainly can. Interestingly enough, I think the first-time buyers are very interesting. They, right at the beginning of the year, our members were reporting a sizable increase in the percentage of first-time buyers who were actually looking for properties as a percentage of applicants. We were actually back up to sort of the 25%, 30%. Estate agents can help, most certainly, but, of course, my best advice would always be, as far as your finance is concerned, go and get it sorted out and go and see somebody independent to do that. And how about your members saying what a property is worth? How on earth do you fix the value when they've been up, they've been down, they're now sort of plateauing, they may be about to fall again. We don't know. How hard is it to fix a property and say that is worth X hundred thousand pounds? It is actually quite difficult at the moment and that has been borne out by our latest research showing that valuers on behalf of the lenders are having a terrible job trying to decide and very often are reducing the value when they put their report in. But at the end of the day, the property is worth what somebody's prepared to pay for it on the day. If somebody comes along and says, I'm prepared to pay 200,000 for it, the vendor says, I'm prepared to sell it at 200,000, who's to say that's the wrong value? Because I wouldn't. Well, one aspect of the property boom has been the growth in the buy-to-let market, borrowing money to buy a house or flat, then renting it out, hoping to make money from it. Indeed, some people have blamed buy-to-let for the boom in house prices of the last few years. For many people, though, property remains their dream investment. There's something tangible, literally, about bricks and mortar. More than 10% of the money lent for mortgages is for buy-to-let. And although the number of new buy-to-let loans is falling, it's still more than 80,000 a year. So can you still make money out of property in these difficult times? Times. Last week, I went to Sheffield to see Shona Davison. She was recently voted National Property Woman of the Year by the National Landlords Association. Shona got into buy-to-let by accident, but now runs eight flats. I met her at one of them in the Eccles Hall district of Sheffield. Hello. Oh, hello. Are you hello. Shona? Yes, I'm Paul hi. from Moneybox. Nice hello. Kirsten. So, Shona, here we are in your buy-to-let house. It's not really a typical buy-to-let, is it? It's a sort of suburban house. It's not a, yeah. a city centre flat. No. It's... Just tell me about it. What's it like? We're in well, the living room. Yeah, this is the living room. Because it's a house which has been converted to two flats, it's quite quirky. It's got a little unusual shape, which I actually quite like about it. It's a sort of lozenge shape, but yeah. it's, got, it's got a very nice view over down the road, hasn't it? It's yeah. a, you've got a nice long distance and some trees you've in the background. You've got some lovely views. Right. OK, so we've got the lozenge-shaped living room and the view, and then what have we got through here? And then, careful on these steps, because they're really steep. Right, we're going down to the basement now. Goodness, those are steep, aren't they? <laughs> steep stones, Sheffield steps down. Yeah. Now, I've just had some, some damp proofing done down here, so it's got all the plaster over there is drying, and then I'm getting it decorated on Monday. 
Well, we come back up the stairs to the living room and Shona's uh, sat down with her laptop to show me how she keeps track of her eight flats. Whenever I'm making a big decision, then I look at all the numbers and put it in Excel. This particular spreadsheet, I've got all of my properties, including the one I live in, along oh, right, the, so bottom, along the bottom, on t- yeah. on, in tabs. And then I have all the specific details and the rent I'm getting, the mortgage, my interest rates, any extra costs like insurance... And then it all feeds into this front sheet. Is that essential, really, to managing a property portfolio? I think it's absolutely critical. I think that's the most important thing. You need to know that if the circumstances change, interest rates, house prices going down, things like getting more voids, which is happening at the moment for me. Getting more voids when the flats are empty? Yeah, I think there's more competition. You need to know if that's happening and be on top of it so that you have time to react. When you started this seven, eight years ago, things were very different from how they are yeah. now. How have you been adapting to the current economic crisis and the recession? Well, because it's been harder to get tenants recently, you have to be more flexible and more open to negotiation. So I often get tenants asking if they can have the rent a little bit reduced, and I am open to that. For example, one lady wanted the rent reduced quite a lot, and that one had been empty for a few weeks So I agreed to it, and she also wanted to tie in for 12 months instead of six months, which she will have done so that I can't put the rent up after six months. (laughs) So I thought that was quite good business sense of her. But, yeah, I said yes to that. But it's a good deal for you because you've you've got a tenant for 12 months that you presumably trust. I'm happy because, like I said, voids are the most expensive things. What sort of rate of return on your investment in these properties are you getting? I reckon that the ones I've got, if you look at their current value probably about 6 or 7%. And now that property prices have started coming down, are you thinking of buying more? Is this a good time to buy? I would like to buy more at some point, but with the credit crunch, mortgages are harder to get. The equity will have fallen in my flats because house prices have gone down and the banks, are, they want higher different loan-to-values than they did before. So even if I wanted to buy, I'm not totally sure that I'd be able to get any more equity out or if it would be wise to do that. Plus, I've got such good mortgage deals because I got trackers just before the credit crunch. If I remortgaged any of them to get a deposit out, I would lose the benefit. I'm making a lot of profit every month just by luck because my mortgage has gone down. So one aspect of the recession is that your costs have gone down a lot because your mortgages have gone down. It's not true of all buy-to-let landlords, is it? No, and that's one of the things when I look at my figures, I always try and work out what is because of luck and what is because of what I've done. Because if I got carried away thinking I'm doing so well and spending that money, I'd get a shock when interest rates go back up. So I'm putting that money aside. Do you think some people who got into buy-to-let at the right time thought they were really good at it, but in fact they were only good at it because the price of their properties was going through the ceiling? Yeah, I I definitely think that will have happened a lot. Because you could buy in the boom and not get good tenants or not do your figures properly. And it didn't matter because you would still make money because the house prices were rising. So you could get away with making mistakes. That's not the case now. Sheffield landlady Shona Davison, National Property Woman of the Year. Peter Bolton King, does buy to let have a future? I hope it does, Paul, because otherwise we've got problems. The uh, private rented sector is something that we're going to be relying on to house an awful lot of people over the next few years. The sector has started picking up again. It is difficult to get mortgages, but the last CML, Council of Mortgage Lenders, figures show there was an increase. The average return you're getting on your capital is now up to back over 5%, about 5.1% on our, our views. And I think, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting Shona, and uh, what she's doing is being very, very sensible about things. But doesn't the arithmetic only work if you know you're going to make a capital gain from the from the price of the property? The rent can't really balance the expenses over the long term and make a profit. No, no, there are people now looking at it on an investment point of view as far as the rental income is concerned, not just relying on the capital return. Jonathan, is this a good investment? There have been times when uh, investing in property has been the right thing to do. I do not believe it is the time now. I believe it will be again at some point in the future, probably in a few years' time. But is it an investment you'd recommend? 5% return sounds no, not bad. not at all, because the, that, that's not taking into account the, uh, the capital loss, which is massive. 
And P Paula, John, what about mortgages? Are, there are buy-to-let mortgages. The number are, is growing, though more slowly. Can you still get a, a mortgage if you're a new buy-to-let investor? I don't know how many new buy-to-let investors there are out there, given what we've just been talking about. It's not necessarily the best time, I would agree. But yes, there are deals out there. Some lenders will want a 40% deposit. Um, some don't want that much. We've got some new entrants to the market, like Bank of China, for example, which will give you a 4% rate at the moment. But again, they're going to want a 35% deposit and a face-to-face -face interview, and you need a squeaky clean credit record. So you can do it, but you need an awful lot of money behind you to start with. You mentioned foreign banks, and I, I did read the other week that there are a number of foreign banks coming in, not just for buy-to-let, but for, for all mortgage deals. Bank of China, I think a Swedish bank. Is this something that your, your readers are now interested in, going, going to a foreign bank for their mortgage money? Well, I think people will go anywhere they can get a mortgage at the moment. The problem with these new entrants, the Bank of China, for example, the products they're offering are very, very good. If you're just a purchaser, you can get bank base rate plus 2.5%, so that's a 3% mortgage deal. That's great. But again, you need the big deposit, you need a squeaky clean record, you need an interview face-to-face. -face. The other two who've come into the market are a Swedish bank and an Israeli bank, and they're going for the high end, so they're going for a million pound plus mortgages. So it's interesting that they're coming into the market, but it's only going to affect a tiny niche of borrowers, unfortunately. So it's a bit of same old, same old, that if you've got a good record, you want to borrow a lot of money, and you've got, you've got a lot of money, then you're OK. Yes, if you've got lots of money, you can borrow lots of money. It, exactly. doesn't, it doesn't help the first-time buyer who's struggling to raise that deposit. Um, do you think that we perhaps are coming to a, a good conclusion from this problem, Peter Bolton King, because we're no longer looking at our house as a money box. It's not something that will inevitably grow in value. It's our home, and we should look on it in that way, not as a source of finance. If there's one good thing that comes out of this problem we've had, it's exactly that. People have been far too used to looking at their properties as a cash-rich cow. I've been warning against that. Um, you might be surprised to hear that, but I have been. And uh, I think if we start looking at it as a home over our head rather than this investment all the time, then it'll be better. Paula John. Oh, to sum up, a much-used phrase of mine, nesting, not investing, is something we always <laughs> advise our readers to do. Yes, it is all about your home and not necessarily looking to make a quick buck or even a buck over the longer term at the moment. So, yeah, one, I suppose, positive of, of this bust will be perhaps a bit of a reality check for people. And, Jonathan, does it matter what happens to house prices? If you've got a home, it's still worth one home, whatever happens to the overall price. So long as your debt is relatively minimal, so long as you stay in work earning, then you're absolutely correct, and that's brilliant. You have some, a roof over your head, but if you lose your job, you're going to have great problems. You said earlier you thought prices were going to fall and then they were going to stabilise. Five years from now, 2014, where will they be? I would say 2014, according to our forecast, they're going to be somewhere between 20 and 30% lower than today. Peter Bolton King? 5 to 10% up from today. 5 to 10% up. Paula John? I would tend to agree with Peter, around 5 to 6% up. Up from where they are now, but that's still a long way below where they were at one time. Well, that's it, I'm afraid. That's all we've got time for. My thanks to uh, the Editor-in-Chief of Your Mortgage, Paula John, Peter Bolton King from the National Association of Estate Agents, and to financial planner Jonathan Davis. You can find out more from the BBC Action Line 0800 044 044 and, of course, our website, bbc.co.uk slash moneybox, where you can listen again, download a podcast, read a transcript, and let us know what you want us to cover in the regular editions of Moneybox, which start next weekend. This week, the producer was Bob Howard, and I'm Paul Lewis.